Hello. I'd like to start by welcoming everyone who is joining us today for this DIA Networking Storage Forum sponsored presentation. In today's presentation, we'll be covering the introduction of QUIC, a general purpose transport layer, <coughs> transport layer network protocol. Before we jump into the presentation, I'd like to quickly cover a few things on the Brightface user interface. First, some of the graphics and text within the presentation may be slightly small, so I'd recommend enlarging your viewing area to full screen. This can be accomplished by clicking on the double arrows on the lower right-hand corner of the presentation. You also find a chat box where you can ask questions to our presenter, and we encourage you to make this presentation interactive by asking questions. However, we will wait till the end of each section before we do jump into the questions. Oftentimes, with great participation, we can't cover all the questions in the allocated presentation time. If this happens to be the case, we will be releasing a blog for the SNEA, on the, the SNEA website that contains all the questions that were asked during the presentation with the corresponding answers. You can look for that there. Also, we frequently get requests for the presentation uh, if it will be made available. Uh, we will be doing that in a PDF format and it will be posted to the SNEA website as well after the presentation. Finally, we do request that you rate this presentation when we are fin finished. Uh, if you have options of you have the option of rating between one and five stars, with five being the best. There is also a comment and suggestion area, and we'd love to hear from you. We value your comments as they can help us to improve the quality of future presentations. Real quick, I'd like to give you a, a quick introduction. My name is Tim Lustig, and I'll be your moderator today. With me, we have a special guest speaker, Lars Egret. Lars is the Technical Director for the networking, for networking in NetApp's Office of the CTO. Lars is an experienced technologist with deep experience in the networking architectures, systems, and protocol designs, ranging from the Internet to data centers to IoT and edge environments. Lars has been leading the networking standardization as part of the Internet Engineering Task Force Steering Group and has been on the architecture board for over two decades. He currently chairs the Quick Work Group and is delivering this new Internet protocol. He serves on numerous program and organizational committees as well as on, the, on boards and other boards. I'd like to extend a warm welcome and thank Lars for joining us today for this presentation. A few things quick before we jump into the presentation. If you're not familiar with, uh, with SNEA, I'd like to cover a few things. We are a global industry association chartered with advancing the adoption of storage networking. Within our charter is to remain vendor neutral, and we have representatives from over 185 leading organizations and over 2,000 uh, 2, active contributing mem members. As a global organization, we reach over 50,000 end users worldwide and focus on standard adoption and education. Listed here are a few of the topics covered under the SNEA framework, everything from networking to storage protocols to storage architectures, virtualization, and software-defined solutions. Lastly, before we jump into this presentation, I want to just cover something that our lawyers make us include. This, is, <clears throat> this shouldn't be a surprise to anyone, just standard legal talk. The materials that you're seeing today is copyrighted by SNEA, and any use of the materials within the presentation is permitted as long as the slides are reproduced in their entirety and SNEA is referenced as a source. Be aware that there are no warranties expressed or, in, or implied or that the information on the information presented, and you will be using it at your own risk. At this time, I'll go ahead and turn this over to Lars so he can get you started with the agenda and jump into the presentation. Lars, take over. Thanks, Tim. Hi guys, welcome uh, everybody to the talk. I'm dialing in from Finland, so I'm uh, apologizing if, if the audio quality is a little bit poor. I'll try my best to speak clearly and slowly um, as far as I'm possible. Um, today we're going to talk about QUIC, which is a new transport protocol for the Internet um, that originally was uh, done inside of Google and shipped as part of Chrome and also deployed on the Google Edge services. Um, since then, Google has um, made this... Uh, protocol available for standardization in the IETF. They've basically given up change control. Um, there's now basically two flavors of QUIC. I'm going to be talking about Google QUIC or GQUIC uh, when I mean the sort of proprietary Google protocol that is now being replaced with the standard uh, of the IETF. And typically when I say QUIC, I just mean IETF QUIC. But sometimes in order to contrast it better to Google QUIC, I also explicitly say IETF QUIC. Um, we're going to go about over a few things. Um, we're going to talk about what are sort of the challenges that in the internet that we've seen 
that motivated the design of Quick. Um, talk about some of the current challenges that we still have. Um, I'm going to highlight a few uh, aspects of Quick that I find particularly interesting and important. Uh, Quick is a complicated protocol, so I'm not going to be able to cover like it, everything in its entirety, um, but I'm trying to get through the highlights. And I'm going to talk a little bit at the end, if we have time, about what the current status of the protocol and the standardization effort, uh, and we do some Q&A. Um, you're welcome, as Tim said, to uh, post questions during the talk. I'll try to get to them uh, either at the end of the slide or at the end of the section, but I might also decide to move them towards the end if I feel that you know I'll, I'll cover that material in a few slides down the road. All right. Um, right, so in a nutshell, Quick uh, tries to hit a few uh, important points at the same time. It's supposed to be a fast transfer protocol for the net, meaning uh, it's supposed to deliver better user experience for web traffic uh, and potentially other content in the future, um, better than what the current standard is, which is uh, TLS over TCP carrying HTTP2. Um, it's supposed to be secure, um, more secure, ideally, than the protocol I just mentioned. So Quick is always encrypted. There's no plain text mode in Quick. Um, it's end-to-end -end encrypted. Um, and the, uh, we're trying to uh, make it um, both resistant to uh, massive surveillance, but also prevent the network from making assumptions about Quick that will lead it to ossification, like we've seen with TCP. I'm going to talk about that problem that we've seen with TCP in a few slides, but basically it's become very difficult to evolve TCP forward. Um, which brings me to a third bullet here. We want Quick to be evolvable for the foreseeable future. Um, at least as long as we've been, evolved, been able to evolve TCP, ideally, ideally longer. That means we need to prevent the network from making assumptions what Quick might look like on the wire, and we also want to be able to deploy new versions of Quick quickly. Um, and Quick is supposed to be a transport protocol, right? It's supposed to be something that carries uh, similar types of workloads than TCP carries at the moment, but potentially more, such as real-time media, which would at the moment go over different protocol stacks that has its own issues. And we want to make it easier to provide, uh, make it easier to write good applications on top of Quick. Uh, the socket API is uh, pretty simple, but if you actually want to use it in an optimal way, it becomes quite difficult and very platform specific, because you need to um, use a whole bunch of uh, platform specific socket options. With Quick, hopefully, we can avoid some of those things. Um, there's a question already um, whether Quick is appropriate or targeted to non-HTTP traffic. Um, I'm going to get to that, but in the moment, at the moment when the Quick group was chartered, the web was the big customer of this protocol. So at the moment, the entire protocol design is very much driven by carrying web traffic well, better than uh, over HP2. However, um, there's a strong interest from a bunch of people to run other workloads on top of Quick. For example, Microsoft has done a blog recently where they're talking about shipping SMB over Quick. Um, and I fully expect that we're going to see other protocols that want to run on top of Quick in the future. Um, right. Um, so this is basically, this is the only math I have, these <laughs> four circles and three pluses. That's Quick, right? It runs on top of UDP. I'm going to get to that why. It has congestion control. That's what the CC stands for. It incorporates TLS for security, and, and the first workload that we're carrying is HTTP. Right, so the summary, if, if you can't stick around for the, for the uh, end of it, right, so my prediction is that the web will move to Quick first and then everything else will follow and this will happen this year, or at least it will begin to happen this year. We're currently looking at shipping the RFC standards um, early fall. Um, we know that Facebook has enabled it already, has been able to ITF Quick on Facebook.com. Google has just said that they've uh, enabled ITF Quick on YouTube.com and uh, a bunch of the uh, CDNs like Cloudflare ha also have ITF Quick enabled already. And um, as the browsers ship that support Quick by default, um, we're going to rapidly see the traffic go up. So, you know, if you do anything with HTTP or TCP or just networks, then you should really sort of have Quick on your radar because you're going to see a bunch of it in a few months' time. Right. So, so what do we mean? What do I mean when I say internet transport? For those of you who are not like internet transport people. So this is sort of the, the internet hourglass, depending on when you went to college and took your networking class, you might have seen this, this uh, hourglass. So this is inspired by the OSI seven layer model. Um, the internet uh, omits a few of those. So basically on the bottom of this hourglass, 
we have a whole bunch of sort of physical networking technologies like copper fiber or like physical media like copper fiber radio. Then you have uh, layer two protocols like CSMA and Sonnet. This tells you how dated this, this uh, slide is. Um, you have Ethernet and PPP and other uh, layer two technologies. And on top of all of them, you have IP, which is like really the one protocol that binds all of these lower layers together with a common abstraction, which is very, very simple. It gives you packets, it gives you routes, it gives you forwarding, and that's pretty much it. And on top of IP, again, the hourglass gets wider. You have more variety. You have TCP as a transfer protocol, UDP as a transfer protocol, there's RTP, there was SCTP at some point. And on top of those, you have application layer protocols like HTTP, and then you have applications like email and, and w, the web and so on. Um, and the gentleman on, on that little uh, um, cover shot is Winsurf, um, who uh, here has contracted COVID-19, so we wish him well. He seems to be recovering pretty nicely. But this is one of the few shots where he's not wearing, wearing a three-piece suit. And, and if you can't read it, it says IP on everything, which was the motto for IP. Right? No matter what your link layer or your physical layer is, IP was going to run on top of you and integrate you to the internet. And the transfer layer specifically sits on top of IP, so it's layer four uh, in this diagram. It's the light blue thing that says TCP and UDP. And that provides some abstractions to applications that IP doesn't provide. IP just gives you packets, right? But packets are not necessarily so useful to applications. Typically, as applications, you want to exchange like larger objects. Um, and so the, tra the transfer layer gives you protocols that let you do that, right? TCP gives you uh, a reliable in-order delivered byte stream, for example, which is a very useful abstraction. Um, transfer layer gives you unicast and multicast delivery. It gives you multiplexing of different uh, application level objects onto a single underlying network connection. It gives you a reliability. IP doesn't. When IP drops a packet, that packet is gone. If you want reliability, you need to provide it at a higher layer, and the transport layer does that and gives you flow control and congestion control. So it gives applications useful abstractions that make it easier to build applications for the internet. So that's the, the classical hourglass, I'll call it. That is, this has changed a little bit. So this is like the 2015 version. And there's a few changes. Um, most notably, the waste. Uh, this is called the twisted martini glass version, by the way, uh, because of the IPv4 and IPv6 stem uh, at layer three. So IPv4 had problems running. We're running out of addresses for a long time, and finally, IPv6 is getting some significant deployment, especially in mobile networks. So in, in reality, you have now two flavors of IP. And other, other, underneath, you still have a whole bunch of link layers, although re realistically, it's like 3G, 4G, 5G, and, and maybe Ethernet or something like that these days. Right? That's, that's the majority of it. Um, and on top, you really don't really have that plethora of, of uh, protocols anymore. You basically have TCP, which carries TLS, which carries HTTP. So it's basically web applications on top of TLS, TCP, and then either IPv4 or IPv6. This is sort of the reality at 2015 and, and still today, right? Um, so TCP has drowned out UDP in terms of traffic volume. HTTP and TLS are de facto part of the transport now. You, you're not building a new application that doesn't run on TLS, and you probably don't build one that doesn't run on top of HTTP either. So the, the consequence really these days, it, it's web apps on top of IPv4 and IPv6 that we're seeing. And, and why is that, right? So there's a whole bunch of things that contributed to this problem, right? One is that, that the transport layer is really slow to evolve, especially TCP. Um, it's, it's a really sort of difficult problem, and I have a more detailed slide on that, but basically um, we are really at the end of, of TCP's evolution because we're hitting some hard limits that are very hard to get around and make progress on. Um, that, is, that is one problem. Second problem, the network itself, the internet and also local networks, have made assumptions about what a TCP flow looks like and how it behaves. And they try to help it and manage it. So there's all these TCP accelerators, RAM accelerators, the firewalls that do the packet inspections and, and they do network address translation. So, so if you're trying to change TCP to evolve it forward, what you quickly find is that there's some box somewhere in the network that is now bro broken um, because it made an assumption that TCP was going to look a certain way forever, and now you change that. But it made it very, very difficult to evolve TCP. The, the, Hardest thing we've done in the ITF is like figure out what breaks somewhere else if we make this little change over here. And the web happens, right? Almost everything runs on top of HTTPS anyway. It's easier, cheaper to develop and deploy on. Um, it, it meshes well with the trend in mobile and cloud, and, and it also has a baked in client server assumption. So those three things together basically mean that you have the hourglass 
with a twisted martini stem and on top everything is web apps. Um, so what are some of these authentications? So I mentioned before that the, net, the network sort of um, you know, made assumptions about what TCP and internet traffic looked like. So originally, right, in the internet architecture idea is if you had an IP address of some other node, you could send that node packets um, at any, from anywhere at any time. And reality, what we now have is there's a directionality and a timeliness to that communication. So there's, there's a client-server assumption baked in. The client needs to talk to the server first and then the server can answer for some period in time. And after that, the server can't answer anymore. Um, that's because firewalls and network address translators just time out that state. Um, and that's a pretty you know, big change in terms of what the internet delivers. It's, it's no longer, peer-to-peer -peer applications are no longer deployable because of this. Originally, we thought second line, many protocols would run on top of IP, many transfer protocols. In reality, firewalls drop everything that TCP or UDP and enterprise firewalls frequently also drop UDP. So all these protocols, we did SCTP and DCCP and, and what have you, don't get to deployed on the internet because they get dropped by firewalls. End-to-end um, -end addressing, right? And address is supposed to have meaning globally for the network. Now it's being rewritten by middle boxes along the path. So the, the address that you put on a packet are not the addresses that the receiver necessarily sees. We have these ideas of using these option headers, extension headers, uh, as a way to extend protocols like IP as IP options, TCP as TCP options. In reality, that didn't work because um, whenever you know some firewall was designed, a certain number of options existed, and it assumed that those were the options uh, in perpetuity. And if you want to define a new option, what will happen is that firewall will now drop it, and these things never get upgraded. So basically, we we, we have an extension mechanism that isn't useful to anymore. And then some other like higher layer things that like bits, mean, bits have meaning only inside one layer, and the network thinks that they can touch bits that are like in the network layer which belongs to it, but also the transport mm -hmm. layer header or even the application header. So like video transcoding by the network was a big problem uh, a few years ago, um, and so on. So this basically the, the network has changed quite a bit and it's made a lot of assumptions that it maybe shouldn't have uh, made. Um, if you follow sort of the pure internet architecture. That makes it difficult to, to change things at the transport layer. Um, what are some of the challenges that specifically with TCP or have seen with TCP over the years? Right? We're really hitting hard limits. I don't know if you can see that little graph there. It's the TCP header, um, and you will see that there's an arrow to a field, and that field is telling you how many option bytes you can put into that header. And, and that, the maximum number of option bytes in TCP is 40, which is not a lot. And specifically, it's not a lot if you're thinking that if a modern TCP stack already consumes, you know, stack options, timestamp options, window scale, so on. So half of that is basically gone. And if you want to do something nice like multipath TCP, we did that a few years ago, that one's 12 bytes out of that 40. So you can see that we really don't have a lot of runway left here to do something new with TCP. And even if we could, right, I mentioned before, we did multipath TCP. Um, it took us 10 years from the research we did um, in, in Europe to getting it shipping with Linux 5.7 now. Um, and most of the time was spent on making it so that the network doesn't break when it sees multipath TCP packets. So basically, your new TCP must look exactly like your old TCP, otherwise it gets dropped. And, and that makes it very complicated to do something new. And then there's small upgrades like us, right? Um, it requires a kernel update um, on servers and clients. It's getting better now that consumer operating systems and Linux is, is seeing uh, more frequent updates, but it's still months to years, and it still takes reboot, and it's not nice. And TCP headers are not authenticated or um, encrypted, right? So basically, um, the network can still do whatever it wants with, with that data, and that, that's a problem that's going to be with us with TCP forever. Um, and middle boxes, you know, there's different kinds. Some of them are benign. This is sort of a canonical example of what's called a van accelerator, where you have, you know, a, a TCP connection that goes maybe over a satellite link, and that has a long uh, uh, RTT associated with it, a long delay to go up and down into geosync orbit. So what you do is you break that, that TCP connection, you put in two boxes on the upstream and the downstream of that satellite link, and, and what those boxes do, they basically lie to the sender and receiver about what has been acknowledged by the other side, um, which is breaking the TCP end-to-end -end semantics, but uh, they gain you a whole bunch of latency, which is why everybody basically wants that functionality. So you know, there's, there's 
good reasons for wanting to meddle with TCP traffic in the middle. Unfortunately, there's also not so benign reasons, right? So everybody by now has uh, seen the, you know, the, the NSA uh, infrastructure for mass surveillance. Quantum insert is one tool in their toolbox, for example, right? It basically um, takes advantage of there not, not being any authentication in TCP. So if, if the client sends a SYN connection open request to the server and an NSA-controlled node happens to be on that path, and it's closer to the client, it can basically erase that original server and, and respond faster. And if it manages to do that, that client will talk to that NSA control server from now on without the user realizing. And on the right-hand side, you have uh, what China is doing. You probably all heard about the Great Firewall. There's a, a fascinating side of it, which is called the Great Cannon, uh, which basically uh, turns users on the Internet that happen to retrieve some stuff from China uh, they insert JavaScript into uh, whatever gets served so that that user browser becomes a DDoS attack. And they're not doing this to one user, they're doing it to millions of users at the same time. So it's basically a cannon that they can point at, at victims you know, very, very quickly. Um, and I hope we can all agree that those are maybe not so great uh, uh, effects of having no authentication and no encryption at the network layer or the transport layer. Um, so let's talk about quick. Um, I hope I'm motivated now. Uh, the, the need for maybe something new, and I'm motivated why TCP is hard to um, hard to uh, evolve. Um, I'm going to quickly look at your questions here, since this is a natural breakpoint. Um, have I mentioned which browsers have quick support? Uh, no, I haven't. Uh, um, I, at the moment, uh, Chrome obviously supports Google Quick still, uh, although Google Quick is quickly turning into IETF Quick. Um, Firefox is implementing it, um, and so at the moment, right, there's only Firefox, and everybody else is, is Chrome-based or Chromium-based. So Microsoft Edge, uh, Safari, and, and Chrome, they all, they all basically get their networking stack from Chrome. So they will all get it at the same time. Um, how quick is, uh, how robust is quick the packet loss, I guess, is the question. Uh, it uses TCP's congestion control initially, so it's ex exactly the same as TCP. However, there's some forward error correction ideas that people want to do. Um, audio phone number, I don't know. Uh, sound is garbled, audio phone number, I don't know. Can I explain Autify? I, I hope I did. So basically it means that um, the, the network um, has seen, you know, by seeing lots of TCP traffic uh, be very uh, regular in, in sort of how, what packets are sent uh, in, a, in a flow at what time, with the bit patterns and so on. Um, middle box vendors and have basically made assumption that TCP flows will look like that forever. And if you want to change what TCP does, some of those bit patterns are now going to look different and stuff will break. But that's what I mean by authentication. It's this idea that, that by, not, by not changing, and by not encrypting, by exposing plain text to the network, the network will make assumptions, unwarranted assumptions, that, that those things will never change. All right, um, quick. So this is a uh, stolen from Jana Yanga's talk on quick that he gave at SICOM. But basically, so it just motivates why Google did quick, did quick and this motivates you know, why everybody wants to do quick too. So let's say you're Google, right? And, and you uh, are serving web content and there's a latency budget you have, which is this column there. And that gets spent on, on a whole bunch of things. It, some of the latency is spent on the browser engine. Some of the latency is spent on HTTP processing, TLS processing, TCP and IP. Some of the latency is spent just on the physical network on, on speed of light delay. And some of the, the latency is spent on the Google.com side. Right? But you want to basically make that fast. If you want to shrink that column, what do you do? Um, first thing Google did um, is they build a you know, CDN. So they, they are um, attacking the latency uh, budget from the bottom. They, they're, they're carving out latency there. They're building a planet spanning CDN. Good. You've done that. What do you do next? Uh, you do your own browser, right? So basically, they, they attack the top of the stack. Uh, they squeeze latency out of the browser engine. They squeeze uh, um, latency out of the HTTP implementation. Then they realize, you know, HTTP 1.1 can only ever be so good. We need to do more. So HTTP 2 came along. And that, that basically reduces the top part of that latency column. Um, what do you do then, right? The, that's the middle part. So you need to squeeze the latency out of TCP and IP 
and ideally some of the latency out of the transport through the network, maybe with better congestion control. And this is exactly what motivates Quick. So it's that if you squeeze the latency out of the bottom, if you squeeze the latency out of the top, the middle is, you know, where the sweet spot is at the moment. That's the low-hanging apple uh, where you can gain more latency. Or we can, no, shed more latency, I should say. Um, this is the same type from before, and this sort of gave, gave rise to Quick, right? So it's supposed to be fast, supposed to be secure, evolvable, and a transfer protocol. So it's the intent is that it solves these things that I mentioned earlier. Um, and it's not that new. I mentioned that uh, it's been shipping. Uh, so, so Google has been shipping this with, in Chrome and deployed it on, on their services side since 2014. Um, the plot down there is a little bit dated. However, it's one of the few plots from Google that actually has some numbers on the y-axis, which is nice to see. So it shows you the, the fraction of quick traffic out of Google in the years 2015 and 16. And you can see that at the end of 2000. Uh, 16, 30% uh, of all bytes out of Google were quick, Google quick. And, and the number that they cite in the paper to mid-2017, which isn't on the graph, it was 35. And depending on how you count internet traffic, some say that 35% of, of Google equals 7% of all bytes on the internet. And this is already a pretty significant fraction before anybody else did it. Um, and so you know, Quick is already, is already there. If you're using Chrome and you're going to any Google service, Chrome will try Quick first. You can go to sort of the develop review and, and see what protocol is used for the transfer and it's usually going to be Quick. Um, what does the picture look in the stack? Right on the, on the left, we have, I've shown it several times, we have HTTP2, TLS, TCP over IP. Um, on the right, we have the Quick stack, right? So we have an HTTP layer, which is simpler than HTTP2, uh, because Quick provides more uh, uh, things that HTTP needs as a transport, so it can, the HTTP binding is simpler. And Quick itself is this pretty hefty protocol that sort of incorporates TLS 1.3 as a as a security protocol. And and the reason it incorporates is that so we're, we're using uh, TLS 1.3 to secure Quick end to end, but we're also carrying the TLS handshake messages inside of Quick. So it's this weird. Um, you know, conjoined architecture. And originally, TCP, uh, uh, Quick is going to steal TCP's congestion control and loss recovery because they work well on the internet. Uh, eventually, there's going to be some uh, evolution here, I think. Why are we doing UDP, right? I mentioned that TCP is getting hard to evolve uh, a bunch of times already. Other protocols, frankly, are just blocked by middleboxes, by firewalls. That's why SCTP, which SCTP actually inspired a lot of the features in Quick. It has multiple logical streams that are you know, multiplexed on top of one network connection. Quick has that too. We took it from SCTP. But SCTP was never deployable on the network because it used a new IP protocol number. And so, you know, that, that killed it. You can encapsulate it in UDP, but then you might as well do something better. So, the only things that make it through the internet in terms of protocols are basically TCP and UDP. And TCP is hard to evolve. UDP is all we have left. So, so we're going to use UDP. And we're not using it. doesn't have any features. We're just basically using it as a wrapper to make our stuff go through the internet. Um, and even that is not without problems. Right? Many middle boxes, especially the home routers, uh, have this assumption that UDP is only used for DNS traffic, domain name traffic, which means that you know it's a ping pong packet exchange to look up a name and then that connection, quote unquote, is gone. So they're using very short timeouts for uh, maintaining the state. Um, there's some issues with NIC hardware, with NIC offloading. So TCP has seen a lot of uh, offload support from ASICs on NIC, so you can go, you know, 10, 40, 100 gig uh, over a single flow these days. And with TCP, not so much with Quick. Um, we're gonna catch up, but but for for the foreseeable future, using Quick in a sort of high-speed LAN, it's not going to be a great idea. It's going to change when the NIC vendors update their offerings. Um, and there's other benefits with running on top of UDP. We can you know, ship Quick as a library in user space. So you can, you know, Facebook is updating their Quick stack whenever they update the Facebook app on iOS. But you're no longer tied to uh, updating the kernel. And this is, you know, talking about containers and all of that, right? This is, this messes really well. You can basically you know, roll out your, your system with a new quick container underneath, and you don't care what the host operating system underneath is. 
So there's, there's a whole bunch of benefits to being able to do that, not needing anything in the kernel. Uh, why do we need congestion control? I hope that's uh, not something I have to spend a lot of time on. Uh, the picture is a highway in, in China. It's not a parking lot, but it sort of motivates why congestion control for the road system makes sense. It, it makes also sense for networks. You need functional congestion control if you want to run on the internet, period. Um, we're going to take what works for TCP and apply it to Quick. So we're going to need a bunch of stuff from TCP. Like we need packet number. We need some acknowledgement that, that tells the sender that the packet got delivered. We need to sort of estimate around trip time. So we're taking concepts that have originated with TCP and are proven to work, and we're going to just use them for quick. Um, there's not a lot of you know, innovation here, but I suspect this will change because um, with quick, the control information that drives the congestion control is actually encrypted end-to-end, -end, so it's not visible by the network like it is with TCP. And so we can actually change it. For example, originally there was this idea that a quick receiver should uh, send a timestamp, a received timestamp for every packet back to the sender. So the sender could have an extremely accurate record of when every packet was delivered. So you could basically measure a delay at a per packet level. It was taken out for various reasons, but this was very deployable with, with quick because it's not visible to the network. You could never deploy this in TCP because some network box would die seeing an option that it didn't know about. Um, why do we want security? Specifically, why do we want TLS? Right? So end-to-end -end security is critical for the Internet. It's, it's also, he says, critical for other environments. Um, you want to protect the users. You want to prevent the network from making assumptions about what your traffic looks like. And, and TLS is very widely used. Right? So we're going to just leverage all of that community R&D. We can leverage the, the public key crypto infrastructure that exists, the certificates, uh, authorities, and so on. We don't want to do custom security. It is just too much to get wrong. Um, you, you, you want to take some security that, that a lot of researchers are looking at and a lot of people are trying to break. Um, and even TLS had some issues in the past. TLS 1.3 specifically, which is what Quick is using, which is also now recommended everybody to use over TCP. It removes a lot of the stuff that have uh, caused a lot of bugs in the recent past. So it's a, it's a much simpler protocol and it's much better. And it, it improves performance quite a bit. So there's a handshake for subsequent connections, so connections between the same client and the same server after the first one has happened. During the first connection, the client gets a ticket. The client can present that ticket for a repeat connection and uh, cut a whole bunch of round trip times out of the handshake delay. So this is specifically very useful for short object transfers like the common for the web. So it's a big win there. Um, why do we want to do HTTP as our first workload? It's, it's where the impact is. I'm, I'm, I think this is clear, right? The, the web traffic and web apps and RESTful things, even if they're not, you know, carrying web objects, it's where it's at. Um, and the web industry is incredibly interested in improving the user experience and improving security, right? It directly translates into dollars for them. Um, so we're going to get a lot of interest here. Uh, and there's rapid update cycles for browsers, for servers, for CDNs, and so on. So you, we can actually deploy and update quick, very quickly, and, and really make it a lot better. And my expectation, I mentioned this before, is that once we've shown that quick is a better transfer protocol for the web, that it'll also be a better transfer protocol than TCP for many other applications. Specifically, Microsoft seems to believe it has advantages for SMB over the web area network, hence their announcement. Um, Right. So again, this is, I think, a good time to, to ask some questions. Um, I'll go through what, what I find here. What does the acronym QUIC stand for? It's actually not an acronym. So when, the, when uh, Jim Ruskin at Google did, did QUIC first, he basically co coined it stands for QUIC UDP Internet Connection, but it no longer does that. So the Google guys have decided they just want to have it be called QUIC, and it's not an acronym anymore. Um, Next question is, given uh, that QUIC is still based on IP and UDP, wouldn't the middle box issue remain? No, it wouldn't, because um, middle boxes pass UDP traffic, and typically they don't really make any assumptions about what's in the UDP packet. Uh, and so they, they are not, there's not really been much UDP traffic, which is good. There wasn't really much to ossify on, maybe other than DNS. So, so UDP is still pretty deployable end to end. Specifically, there's some measurements that it works. So UDP works on 95% of all paths, 
And there, there's some anecdotal evidence that where it doesn't work, it's typically because it's enterprise networks that just block UDP completely. Um, do we expect pushback from network vendors or governments when they realize they can no longer, no, no longer do deep packet inspection? Yes, we do, and we've seen it heavily already. Um, so um, the question is who can push harder? Like there's a, there was a, a big group of uh, U.S. banks that showed up in the ITF to uh, complain about TLS 1.3 enabling perfect forward secrecy because apparently a whole bunch of their compliance checks were based around um, taking traces of TLS uh, 1.1 and 1.2, storing them, and then basically decrypting them later, which TLS 1.3 makes impossible. And they were not happy, but uh, it's the right thing to do for the web. Um, can I explain where the latency performance benefit comes from? Um, a lot of it for the web comes from a faster handshake uh, because you have these TLS tickets that let you uh, basically send your GET um, with the first client, client packet to the server and have the server return some data with the first packet it sends back to the client. Um, that's where a lot of the, the, the latency hits come, benefits come from. In terms of bulk throughput, there's actually not a whole lot of benefit because we're just taking TCP congestion control. So if you want to just push a lot of bytes, it's going to look more or less the same between quick and TCP. After like a few hundred K or a few meg, it doesn't really matter anymore what you're using. I think my, my questions are being edited or, or add, added to. Um, do you have any measurements on energy battery use? Uh, not at the moment, sorry. Um, How, how do I guarantee reliability or quick? Um, yes, we're borrowing, we're borrowing exactly the same concept from TCP. I mentioned this. We're taking uh, the, basically, we're detecting lost packets based on not getting acknowledgments from the receiver, and we're resending that data. All right, I'm going to save some of these for later. Um, I'm still hoping to get through the slides. And uh, maybe um, Tim can sort of offline prioritize these a little bit. Um, in terms of if there's any clusters of questions that come up. All right, so some selected aspects of, of QUIC. Um, so, so QUIC has a minimal network visible header. Um, this is a little bit different uh, than many other ITF protocols that are basically all header and it's all plain text. Um, with QUIC, we tried very hard to make um, the thing that's visible to the network as small as possible. So specifically with QUIC, the network, there's, there's two types of headers. There's long headers, um, which is the, the top picture there, which I only use for the handshake to establish the connection. And then for the actual data transfer, we're using short headers, um, which is the um, thing on the bottom. And you would, as you would expect, there's less visible things in the short header compared to the long header. So specifically, the network sees you know, the packet type. Um, this is, is this a long header or a short header packet for any given packet? Um, it sees qu the quick version that's being uh, used to establish a connection, but only in the long header. Right? So if you manage to not be able to see the uh, connection establishment, you don't know whether a, you don't know what version of Quick that particular flow is using. Um, you can see a destination connection identifier um, on all packets. Um, that is kind of hard to, um, hard to hide, but that's a, a pretty long random string. Um, and you see a packet number uh, which is obfuscated. It's not encrypted, but uh, we're making it pretty difficult for the network to uh, observe the packet numbers because we want to prevent the network from assuming it has those packet numbers available. Because other, So unlike in TCP, it's perfectly fine for a quick sender to skip packet numbers. So you don't need to use them in sequence. You only need to use them monotonically increasing. So you can send packet 1 and then packet 20 and then packet 700, and that's fine. While with TCP, that's a big problem. And, and we just know that, that you know, middle box vendors are going to get this wrong. And compared to TCP, that, that's basically it. In TCP, there's a lot of other things that are not so key. It's these packets, it's these acknowledgement numbers, it's these information about ECM bits, it's these timestamps, it's these window scale factors and other options. Um, and none of that in TCP is actually encrypted or authenticated even. So the network can actually change that. So this is like MSS clamping, for example, is a technique where like some middle box that's sticking data into a tunnel will, you know, rewrite part of the TCP header to uh, lower 
the, the packet size that goes into that tunnel. This is not possible with Quick, right? Everything, e even the stuff that isn't encrypted, is still authenticated, so it's not modifiable by the network. So the network can't, you know, flip a bit and make a long header packet look like a short header packet. But when it gets to the receiver, it's just, you know, not pass decryption. Um, Quick has version negotiation. Um, so we have a pretty wide version field, 32 bits, uh, compared to IP, which had eight, and TCP, which has actually zero. Um, so that really means that we can, we don't have to worry about burning version numbers. We can rapidly change the Quick version that we're using. Um, the graph there on the right uh, is taken from, uh, again, Google uh, Quick, and, and specifically uh, shows which versions of Google Quick Chrome has been trying to negotiate with the server backend. And you can see that like roughly every like three months or so, Google has basically just replaced the quick version it's using um, on the internet. Um, and that's possible because there's still a lot of bits left. Um, and otherwise, there's uh, the other thing I should mention that this version negotiation also allows uh, vendor proprietary versions to coexist with the standard version we're doing in the ITF. So nobody would stop, like, say, Facebook uh, from shipping a Facebook app that tried to negotiate a Facebook-specific version of Quick with Facebook.com and then use it. Um, and if that wasn't available, it would fall back to ITF Quick. So that's possible, and, and we don't actually uh, want to prevent that. Of course, there's very few invariants that are in Quick. So there's very few things that we couldn't change in the future. Uh, the things that are very hard to change, we've chosen very carefully, and those are, you know, where in the packet uh, are the version numbers, and how long are they, and, and where in the packet are the connection identifiers, and how long are they in the long header packet, and same for the short header. And then, you know, what's the version negotiation response for the server? So, so ver if you have a working version negotiation, you can pretty much change everything else later. So that, that gives us maximum sort of evolvability, we hope. Um, another feature of Quick I mentioned before comes from TLS, which is the ability to do a shortened uh, hand, handshake on a connection reestablishment, which is a big win if you are doing uh, short transfers, but can also um, be a big win if, for example, your firewall loses connection state and you have to reconnect. So any reconnection event basically becomes uh, much less noticeable with Quick because of that. So, so it's a it's a very powerful tool if you're sending, you know, latency sensitive traffic. Um, Quick is a um, you probably wonder, you know, where that header um, are like acknowledgments, for example. So Quick is a is a frame based protocol, which means that after that packet header in the short um, and long packets, um, everything else is frames, and, and frames can come in any order, and um, they, you know, you 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 write your frames into your quick packet until you run out of packet space, and then you send the packet and you start the next one as a sender, for example. And uh, on the right, I have the list of, this is all the frame types we currently have defined, the two most important ones, and also the ones that you might remember from TCP. Acknowledgements, obviously, are important. Receiver sends those to the sender to tell it which packets it got. And the sender sends usually stream data frames that carry application data towards the receiver. So those are the two most common ones, but there's a whole bunch of control frames that are used to negotiate. How many streams can you have open in parallel? Are you blocked uh, waiting for a flow control window to open? You can issue new connection IDs to a peer or force them to retire them. Um, you can verify that a peer has moved to a different IP address and so on. And there's some you know, handshake done in connection false control frames. So it's, it's, a, it's a very extensible protocol because you can also, um, as part of the handshake, um, negotiate whether both sides speak an extended version of this. So you can define new frame types and uh, negotiate their use during the handshake, which is another way to evolve quick forward without necessarily changing the version. Right. And I mentioned before, we have multiple logical streams. Um, on top of one quick connection, we take this idea from SETP. Um, so congestion control happens at the connection level, and the connections are obviously also flow controlled. But they carry multiple streams at the same time, um, and those are sort of units of application data, and they can be quite long. Um, 
They can be UV or bidirectional. Um, this is sort of inherited from uh, HTTP. It's not clear how useful this is for other protocols, but it's there. Um, and at the moment, Quick is always reliably transmitted. However, partial reliability is sort of the next big feature everybody wants for media over the internet. Uh, specifically, you know, not, not streaming media, but live media, where you don't want to retransmit data that's already uh, out of the playhouse buffer at the client. And the number of streams and, and how to use this sort of negotiated over time uh, by the application. And how an application prioritizes streams, you know, whether it wants to retransmit something on one stream versus sending new data on another stream at any given time is completely up to the application. Right. Um, I think I'm just going to quickly finish this, and then we can take the rest of the time for, uh, for questions, and maybe Tim has uh, some grouping uh, that, that he wants me to go through. So current status and some, some sort of discussions that are still ongoing. Um, right. So I mentioned before that in the fall, we're likely going to ship uh, the first set of uh, ITF RFCs on Quick. And this is sort of what we colloquially call Quick version 1. Um, and, and Quick version 2 is everything that is sort of floating around the, the community but isn't part of that. But there's a sort of four big areas that, that I see uh, interest in doing. One is more applications, right? Um, again, SMB has been has been uh, proposed by Microsoft. Uh, real time is the other big thing that wants to go on quick. Streaming wants to go on quick. Um, I don't know what else, but sort of new applications on quick is certainly something where a whole bunch of work is happening in the ITF and in the community. Um, performance improvements, um, both for internet congestion control, that's what the CC stands for, but also, as I mentioned before, for satellite paths or other sort of um, more challenged networks, where at the moment TCP relies on help from the network that won't be available as quick anymore. So that's another whole area of work. Um, Multipass. Um, Google Quick um, had a version of Multipass, which means that um, you want to use two or more simultaneous paths through the network for one connection. You basically want to stripe your traffic over multiple network paths. And, and we do this with multipath TCP. This is um, where the idea comes from. It's difficult there. With Quick, it's, it's easier to deploy. Um, and there's benefits specifically in terms of pooling the capacity that's available along multiple paths for one connection. There's a little bit of a challenge and an unresolved issue um, that stems from so with multipath TCP, we've done that, actually. We can pool the capacity pretty efficiently, but we do so pretty much at the maximum of the round trip times of all of those paths. So um, while it's great if you want to send bulk transfers over the internet, it's not great if you have latency sensitive traffic. And, and typically at the moment, sort of from when we started working on multipath, you know, capacity was the issue. Now it's much more about latency because networks get faster naturally, um, but the latency doesn't come down quite as naturally. So, so it has shifted a little bit. It's not clear whether there's still enough energy that we're going to do multipath, but it's still a topic. And then various other extensions of Quick are the, are the other things that's going on, like using it for tunnels and so on. Um, there's an ongoing debate on, on encryption versus other topics. One is this encryption versus network management, right? There's claims by a bunch of network operators that their network management systems rely on inspecting TCP header information to obtain lost information about flows and round trip times, and that helps them troubleshoot their network. Right? So if they can monitor passively um, the, the loss rates and the round trip times, they, they can know whether something's wrong in their network. And encrypting that information, like Quick does, will be, will be troublesome. Right? And there's some proposals for how we could extend Quick to signal, carefully signal, uh, very limited bits of information to the network for that reason. But there's a lot of uncertainty here. Right? One is the, the, the network operators that claim that they have this problem are not very clear on, on what the problem actually is and, and whether they couldn't work around it some other way. Um, so it's not clear whether this is something that we need to solve with Quick. And then can a network even, even if you know Quick presented this information to the network, um, you know, told the network what loss it saw, the network can't really trust this information because it's not used to drive the end-to-end -end control loop. It's just some information that you put on the outside of the crypto envelope. And so 
it's, it's not clear whether it has the same sort of meaning as it has for TCP, where a network can actually be sure that the information it sees is the information TCP acts on. And there's a whole, you know, sub area on what are the incentives here or the penalties for opting in or out for various endpoints. It, it's a difficult discussion that will be with us for a long time. The flip side of this argument is encryption versus allowing passive measurement, right? So um, one could argue, and I'm sort of sympathetic to this view, that, that um, the Internet we have now is, is great because you could always measure it and understand it and make it better. Um, so you could, you know, put a TCP dump or something on a network and you can, you know, dissect the traffic and you can try to understand what happened here. And TCP really benefited from researchers at universities looking at, at weird traces and figuring out what's going on. And I know that, you know, there's field people in various companies that are doing that for a day job, right? They try to figure out why is that customer workload slow and you're going to look and, and see if it's the network or something else. And they rely on that too. And so with Quick, this is going to be quite difficult if you're not, uh, if you don't have the collaboration of one of the endpoints that gives you the TLS keys for that connection. And, and the question is if we're giving up something fundamental here or if you're already at the point because uh, encryption is so prevalent that you need to um, have to buy in from one of the endpoints anyway. Um, to wrap up, um, so Quick's being standardized in the IETF. Um, we're hoping to deliver it in September. Uh, Given COVID, there's a little bit of a question mark here, but I think we're still on track. We have at the moment uh, 20 plus known implementation efforts that are participating in our interop events. There's a whole bunch of big industry names that are involved. Um, basically, um, everybody um, who's shipping a lot of bytes around the internet, with a notable exception of two names, one being Amazon, the other one being Netflix. Um, Amazon is always uh, very quiet about what they're doing, but um, we know that they are at least looking at quick. With Netflix, I, they have a very optimized pipeline for streaming over TCP uh, that they're likely to change, it seems like. However, they are looking at quick for the app because um, the, the user experience, you know, clicking and scrolling and, and rendering the, the, the Chrome, the user interface of the Netflix app might actually benefit from quick. The actual streaming, maybe not so much, but um, they're looking at it too. But they haven't participated in the interrupts, so they're not on, not on this slide. Um, there's a web page for the working group. There's a Slack where everybody who has a quick stack or is implementing one hangs out. If you are now inspired to write a quick stack, please uh, send me an email and join that Slack. Uh, we have like 250 implementers uh, at the moment on that thing, and it's, it's a very good resource. Um, we are interrupting every few weeks. This is sort of uh, uh, an eye chart. Uh, but basically, it has all the clients. Uh, on the vertical and all the servers um, on the horizontal axis, and then we have various test cases. And the more letters and the darker green you see, the better that particular test works. And this is obviously already outdated information as I'm showing it to you. Um, if you want to participate, I mentioned the, the working group in the IETF is open to all. There's a mailing list and there's a GitHub um, that you can join. Um, pay attention to the IETF's IPR disclosure rules before you do. Like any standards body, there's some lawyer stuff, but it's pretty lightweight. You can come to meetings. Um, if they happen, who knows? Uh, Vancouver got canceled. Madrid doesn't look too good. Bangkok maybe, I would say, in November. And, and there's various grants available for academics, which I guess most of you are not. But if you are, uh, you can come and get money to do so. And um, there's a lot of stuff on GitHub, uh, especially there's a lot of open source code for Quick on GitHub already. Um, and I think that's the end for me, Tim. Yeah, uh, thank you. Before we jump into the into the slide, let's just go over the some of the last few questions. We've got about uh, six minutes to do that. I kind of prioritized a few of them at the front here. So, the first question here is uh, asked about uh, what about the security implications of uh, having the protocol in the kernel? Seems like this creates massive holes in security pr paradigms. So it, it, it depends, right? Um, if, you, if you trust your kernel, sure. But I think actually a lot of applications are, are um, happy to do that in the app and, and only trust the kernel with already encrypted data. Um, so so it, is, it is changing the paradigm a little bit. But um, with TLS, until very recently, already happened all at the application layer, right? 
we've we've only recently seen TLS kernel support uh, or or Nick support, and so it, it's in sometimes not not so so new. Next question. Can you explain where the latency slash performance benefits come from? Is it because UDP replaces TCP and a lightweight implementation is possible? So I don't – that's not it, right? So, so, so QUIC is actually a pretty complex protocol, uh, especially compared to TCP. So, it, so it's, it's a lot more complex. Um, the, the performance that we see is, is – it's, it's, it's uh, specifically at the, at the startup phase of the connection and delivers data faster. Here's the data faster than TCP does because the handshakes are shorter. You can, you can piggyback application data during the handshake already, and with TCP, you can't. For bulk data transfer, there's, there's at the moment really no performance benefit, and I would actually say that until you see some uh, NIC support for crypto offload and, and offload of other uh, quick operations, Quick is not going to be able to compete with TCP when it comes to bulk data. Um, I think the, the numbers I've seen, both from my stack and from the Microsoft stack, on a reasonably modern server class Xeon, uh, we're, we're maxing out at 5.5 gigabit per second per core of good put, application good put, which is you know maybe an order of magnitude below of what you get with TCP at the moment, because you need to do crypto. And, and specifically, Quick uses crypto in a, in a slightly weird way, which makes it hard to offload with current generation mix. This will change, and I think this um, bottleneck will disappear. But at, at the moment, um, Quick is not your protocol if you want to do bulk data. Great. Thanks, Lars. Next question. Your layer, layered diagram shows Quick taking over some HTTP, HTTP functions and or changing the SAP between OSI layer four and layer seven, will this be a problem having other for other protocols such as SMMP yep. and FTP? Yeah, I think that that might be an, an artifact in the in the diagram, and this is also something that's changed a little bit um, in the in the working group. In the beginning, when we started um, standardizing Quick, right, um, that when we talked about an application and Quick, the application was the thing on top of the web, and then Quick had basically HTTP in it. That has now suddenly, cha suddenly changed where uh, now when we're talking about an application and Quick, HTTP is the application, and there will be other applications on top of Quick. So that, that diagram might have been a little bit stale, or, or maybe I haven't updated it in a while, but, but the, the model very much is that Quick at, at this time intends to be a transfer protocol that is general purpose, although a bunch of features that it has are inspired by features that the web needs but are hopefully useful for other protocols. So there, there should be a relatively clean uh, interface that has other applications layer on top of it. Thanks, Lars. And on to the next question. Does Quick provide forward error correction options? Not at the moment. So Google Quick did. Um, uh, so Google has shipped uh, some versions of Google Quick with, with uh, FEC support. Um, and they weren't super happy with the results. Um, and so they've taken it out. And so at the moment, it's not on the charter of the IETF working group to deliver forward error correction for Quick. However, um, there's now better understanding of, of a different flavor of forward error correction that might actually be interesting again. So I actually last week talked to some people that want to revisit that and, and maybe add it back. So, so not at the moment, but maybe in the future is the answer. On to the next question, does Quick apply for non-HTTP protocols, in particular data-centric protocols such as SMB, NFS, or iSCSI? Well, it applies on a, I mean, so if you can run over TCP, you can, you can run over Quick, right? Because Quick sort of degrades into TCP in a sense. If you, if you only use one stream and then you, you use that one stream on one connection, you're basically having TCP-like uh, transfer protocol. If you can run on that, on that you can, you can run on top of Quick without changing your application protocol too much. If you want to take advantage of Quick, specifically uh, the multiple parallel streams and prioritization and all of that, you will sort of um, need to use it, uh, you will need to change your use of the transfer protocol. If you have an application protocol that can run on top of SCTP, for example, like I think NFS can, for example, um, that SCTP binding is, is, is going to be very similar to what a Quick binding would look like because it has a lot of the same concepts in it. 
We're running out of time now, so we're going to um, save the rest of the questions. We'll put those into a uh, blog on the SNEA website. I just want to, before we go, make sure we give a, uh, a, a big thank you for Lars joining us today. Content was excellent. We had uh, quite a few viewers online and more questions, I, could, I would say, than, than um, many of the previous ones in the past. So it shows that, that it was a very interesting topic and well received by everybody. So uh, thanks very much for joining us, Lars. We appreciate having you here with us today. For everybody who's listening to thanks the webcast, would you just uh, uh, thank you. Uh, we just like to uh, one more time ask you to please provide us feedback. Um, you know anything uh, as far as uh, um, rate us one to five stars. Give us any feedback for this presentation as well as future, so we can make improvements on them as well. As mentioned, the PDF of this slide deck will be posted on the SNEA website, as long as well as a Q&A session uh, for all the questions that were not answered, as well as ones that were. Uh, if you do not, please follow us on Twitter at SNEA NSF and look for additional webcasts in the future as well as we have archives on our website for ones in the past. This brings our uh, presentation to the end for today. Again, thanks everybody for joining us. Goodbye.